Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Secrets of the Supernatural. I'm your moderator, Tony Spera, along with Ed Warren and Lorraine Warren. Tonight, we're going to speak of a fascinating case that happened right here in Connecticut, the Brookfield Demon Murder Case, which was also made into a book that we have here and also made into a movie of the week called The Demon Murder Case. And what I'd like to do is start off, if I could, with you, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved in this case right from the start? We were contacted by Father Dennis, who at that time was pastor of St. Joseph's Church in Brookfield, Tony. Mm -hmm. And the call came in, and he spoke about a young boy <clears throat> who he had been trying to help, but recognized it as a case of possession. He told me that he was very leery of becoming involved in this case mm -hmm. because he had been assigned by the bishop to exercise another home, but this was not of an individual now, of a home that had infestation going on that we investigated. But he said, I want you to know that you have my prayers. At that time, he was going to Ireland with his mom, and he was concerned, I think, that the devil would get back at him maybe through his mother. Mm -hmm. Now, he spoke of David and David's problems. He said that David had a slight learning disability, and but there was very bizarre behavior occurring to this young 11-year-old boy. When he mentioned about the boy's problem with a learning disability, we had contacted a doctor in Trumbull, Dr. Jim Grasso, and asked him if he would be willing to go to the home with us that night. Mm -hmm. It was a real hot night, Tony. And the reason we asked Dr. Jim Grasso was because he too had a son with a similar problem. And we felt that if there were a type of medication, maybe that David would be on that might have been causing it, that he would recognize that. But that was not the case. Mm -hmm. David's case was not severe enough to have any type of medication. David was in the very beginning stages of demonic possession. Mm -hmm. We went to the house this hot night. I can remember like the steam and the moisture coming off the ground. It was a weird night when we arrived there. First Ed tripped going up the steps into the house. And Dr. Jim Grasso made kind of a laughing comment and he tripped and fell too. And when we got in the house, we were sitting there at the table talking. Now you would watch David and he would be doodling, you know, drawing or something like that. And he'd be concentrating on what he was doing. And then he would look up and it was no longer a little 11 year old boy. Now this 11 year old boy would become extremely strong. I seen nights when it would take four and five men to hold him down. He would be ranting and raving, raving and uh, yelling. Uh, there was times when he would attack his mother. Now this boy loved his mother. He loved his father. And uh, at one time he actually broke the mother's nose, I believe. Arnie Johnson, who was a young man that was engaged to his, uh, his sister, Debbie, would help every night to control the boy. He'd come home from work, he was a landscaper, worked very hard, and uh, he'd have his supper, he'd lay down, but then just around 11 o'clock was when this would occur to David. <clears throat> As Lorraine said, all of a sudden, you'd look at him, he was normal, the next second, it wasn't David anymore. And uh, this would go on until the sun came up, uh, the boy would roll around, uh, he would go into fits. Uh, I seen one time when he actually levitated, had extreme strength, uh, terrible obscenities would come from him. And Arnie Johnson, uh, who was a young man, who I would call probably uh, an all-American boy. He loved sports, he was into baseball, he had many awards for baseball. He loved fishing and uh, he and Debbie, his fiance, who was David's sister, would go off fishing and they'd have a good time. But this kid, 18 years old at the time, would stay awake all night long and then go to work the next morning. 
But he made a fatal mistake. One night he said, and he, he screamed at these devils, mm -hmm. take me on, leave my little buddy alone. He well, challenged. he got his wish. He, he challenged the, he challenged, the demonic. He challenged the demonic. Now, by this time, Tony, into the case, the Catholic priests were already involved. Father Dennis had left for Ireland. Another young priest was assigned to the parish at that time, and another young man who had just recently been ordained mm -hmm. was also assigned there. They came to visit us, and the two of them, finally, it grew to having six priests involved in it. Six priests. Three of them. Three of them. From the Vatican. Three of them ordained and oh. schooled in Rome, these men. And they were very frightened of the things that Arnie would say. He was such a compassionate young man, such a low-key person. Never once did I see him show any type of violent behavior. He was a perfect gentleman. Mr. and Mrs. Warren, this, everything. Just a beautiful person. Tremendous respect for the priest. If you were going to have a son, he'd be the boy you'd want. Yeah, that's the kind of a boy he was, Tony. Mm -hmm. But he made that fatal mistake and, of challenging. Challenging the devils. And I know that one of the Catholic priests even met with him to talk with him because he was so concerned about his welfare. Mm -hmm. And because, like you say, he challenged it, Tony. And remember that when you challenge the demonic, it doesn't act at that particular given time, Tony. Mm -hmm. It waits until you are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And then it strikes. When you least sus sus suspect it. When you least now, suspect it. Now, what happened uh, was actually um, Arnie had gone uh, to a pizza parlor with uh, Debbie, his fiance, and his sisters. They met Alan Bono there, a, a friend of theirs. They went back to the uh, Bono's house, and Arnie disappeared for a few minutes. When he came back, he was somebody entirely different. What now? When he, he doesn't recognize or know anything about what happened from that point on. Well, now, Tony, we're we're going to backtrack from time to time. What I'd like to do, if I could, if I could interrupt for one moment. I know, Ed, that you and Lorraine both have brought slides tonight. You yes. think perhaps we should look at perhaps the first few slides just to get an idea yeah, of what an idea. this was all about? Yes, that's a good idea. So if we could, I'd like to bring up, if we could bring up that first slide, and we'll let all you right. talk about it. The first um, slide, of course, is of St. Joseph's Church okay. in Brookfield, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. All right. This is where the first exorcism took place. Okay. And uh, it's an exorcism that I will never forget. Uh, the first one actually was in the convent, mm -hmm. and that was not successful. Uh, it was that morning when David came under possession and would not <coughs> get into the car. He ran away from his family. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a knife. Uh, he actually tried to kill his mother and his grandmother. And this is not David. David was a very mm -hmm. complacent child, very docile. Mm -hmm. And when I walked in, he was laying on the bed in a fetus position. This priest was standing alongside of him, and I said to the priest, don't stand so close, because he had a bad habit of taking his fist and just hitting you. Mm -hmm. The priest backed up, and suddenly that boy rose up out of the bed very swiftly, landed on the floor, mm -hmm. ran into a bathroom, and locked the door. He would not come out. Hysterical laughter came from the bathroom. Finally, we broke the door. We got him out of there. We brought him. Uh, to the convent at St. Joseph's, where the exorcism was performed on September 9th, the birthday of the Blessed Mother. Se yes, yeah, September 8th. And we felt that uh, this would be successful. And he told us that what they called the beast, which was seen many times in the house and out in the grounds, was back at the house. I went back there, and I had taken holy water with me while the priest stayed in the convent. I then went through the house, and I used what we call religious provocation. I sprinkled the holy water, and there was a rocking chair there. Mm -hmm. This rocking chair suddenly started to move back violently, back and forth. Mm -hmm. There were loud pounding sounds in the house. Mm -hmm. 
and then what I could hear is growling down in the cellar. Now these were some of the sounds that we heard the very first night that we went there with Dr. Gian Grasso, but it sounded like somebody had a two-by-four and was hitting, hitting. the floor. The underneath floor, us, but the nobody was there. Yeah, the floor. Now what's, this, what's this second slide that we're going to see here, Ed? All right, these are some of the headlines. Terrifying story behind the devil made youth kill case. Mm -hmm. That's Debbie Glotzel that you see there, who was a fiance right. of Arnie, and that's Arnie way over in the corner up there. Okay. And we can see the next one. Can we but, that? Okay, they're showing you yeah, as the investigators in the, the case. Yes. Now, what year did you say this was? 1980, we became involved in the case, Tony. Mm -hmm. But, um, y you know, one thing that we have to stress that's very important is that we knew it was inevitable that there was going to be a tragedy. We knew it. We even notified the police. Because of the violence. And Lorraine did notify the police, Chief. That, what, did they, what did they have to say about it? Well, there was nothing we could do in advance. In other words, the, before the fact, there's before nothing. Before the fact, right. there was nothing they could do except watch and go to the calls whenever they would happen at the home. Mm -hmm. But all the priests knew it. It wasn't just myself. It was <coughs> all of the priests who were well aware that it was inevitable there would be a tragedy. But never, ever did we think it would be Arnie Johnson. Now, keep in mind that we had psychiatrists look at this boy. Mm -hmm. They told us, point blank, the boy was not mentally ill. Oh, no. The outward uh, manifestations that we look for in case of possession occurred in that house. Furniture moving around, pounding sounds, the hystericalness of the boy, the strength of the boy, speaking in other languages. Uh, it was just uh, a stereotype possession case. We could look at some more of those okay. slides. We'll show the mother here's another, and father. Here's another article, I guess, on the possession. One. Yes, that's, that's Arnie, Ar Arnie Johnson. There. In the left-hand corner there. Yes. Right. What's now, the next if, slide? You know, the judge, if the judge had let us bring in our evidence, which were yeah. recordings, yeah photographs, eyewitness accounts, and the priests. The priests were waiting outside of the courthouse in Danbury, Connecticut, to go into that courthouse. To testify? And testify that what occurred to this young boy and Arnie Johnson was indeed diabolical possession. But I could understand the judge's feelings, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be known as the judge who allowed the devil made me do it case into his courtroom. Right. Okay. I guess this is an article that talks about the you. The devil made him do it. And okay. the devil did make him do it. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. We were Arnie all... Johnson was under diabolical possession. He didn't know what happened for at least two hours. In that two hours, he had killed Alan Bono. This young man wouldn't hurt anyone or anything. You have to know Arnie Johnson like we knew him. Mm -hmm. Very polite, uh, a very good living young man, very hard working. He worked until 5 o'clock, landscaping, cutting trees, have his supper, go to bed until 11. Mm -hmm. Then he'd get up and he'd stay up all night long, With holding this young boy down. He would, the, he would have David sleep next to him so that the family, the parents, <clears throat> Judy and Carl Glotzel, this took a terrible toll on this family. You cannot believe the emotional and physical toll. I, I always said that if a court would allow us to bring our evidence into this case, that, that there is uh, the, the lawyer, the Martin attorney. Manella, yeah. and uh, he put his position uh, in jeopardy as a lawyer by going in on this case, but he knew that the boy mm -hmm. was possessed. He felt we could win the case never knowing that the judge would not allow us to bring in our evidence. Mm -hmm. But Lorraine and I set a precedent in 1990 in which we did win a case where a, a woman was driven out of a house in Hebron, Connecticut. That was haunted by ghosts. We would have won this case, too. And Arnie Johnson would have not gone to prison. Now, is this, the, is this one of the priests that was in the house? That's the, that's the exorcist. He was the exorcist. Yes, he was. And he was very, very badly affected by and, this case. Yeah, in what way? Well, Tony, it was an all-night session at that house one night. All night we were up mm -hmm. with the exorcisms and the praying. And it was that night, Tony, that I taught that little boy the guardian angel prayer, that angel of God, my guardian yes. dear. I taught him 
how to say that <clears throat> prayer. And that seemed to give this child a certain amount of comfort. And we were all, we were really exhausted, tired. But remember but, that the exorcist is attacked, not just yeah. while he's performing exorcism, but, but in his own rectory. That's what I was just going to tell you. Now, we left there early morning. Father Virgilac wanted to get back to Norwalk mm -hmm. because he was going to say Mass that morning and his parents were going to be at Mass. He did not want them to know. He didn't want them to be concerned for him. Mm -hmm. And he had shared things with his sister, but he had not shared things with his dad, who, by the way, was chief of police. Oh, really? And um, so that morning... Chief of police in Norwalk. Yes. In Norwalk. Yes. Oh, no, not in Brookfield. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now, do we have a picture uh, of the Glatzels? Uh, yeah. I think, yes, there they are. There's okay. Judy and Carl Glatzel. That's the mother and father of David. That is after the boy was exercised. Both but, extremely good people and Jovial uh, people, jovial people. Mr. Glatzel there, as big he is, looks like Grizzly Adams, mm -hmm. could not hold that boy down alone. Oh, no, he couldn't hold him there at all. There were sometimes, as, as I said, four and five men that would have to hold this boy down. Okay, let, let's get into that just a little bit if we could. Now, here's a picture, right, here's there, a picture of him. Yes. What's he coming out of possession. Okay, he's been, crying and he's holding on to his mother. That now, is what he would do, Tony, all the time. Would you say, in your professional opinion, that he was possessed by a devil or a demon or what, what would it be exactly? He, well, he was possessed by devils. De by devils. Yeah, in say. fact, when they were, were spending the night at the Glatzel home, I went into my study and I called on the devil, I thought it was one devil, which they called the beast, to come to where I was at so I could bind the spirit of that devil so well, it wouldn't go back into okay, the house. what's that bind, what's that mean? Binding of the spirit. The priests were casting out the devils of the house. I felt that the beast would then come to where I was and I would bind the spirit through that ritual. But Tony, that was one of the most frightening evenings of my life. There was not one devil. There were 43 of them. 43 which devils. Which came to me as a kaleidoscope, as if you were watching one horrible face after another. And remember, I was in that study by myself. I was say, what did you do? What, what, what happened? What did you do? If it was me, I think I'd have ran out. What did you well, do? Well, I have to be honest with you. I was just stunned. I couldn't move. I was watching. It happened very quickly. And as I watched it, it was like a kaleidoscope of horrible faces coming to me. I knew that I had no power up against this. I felt it was one devil, mm -hmm. and which they called the beast. But when I seen over 40 of them, I knew that we were dealing with the hierarchy of the diabolical world. Mm -hmm. At that point, I gave it up, and I went out of the study. Oh, so you did I leave. left, yes, because I knew that I did not have any control over what was happening here. Now, I was with the priest at the house mm -hmm. during this. So in the morning, I came home with them when they were coming home. And I felt that Father Virgil, like particularly, needed some rest before he, and I wanted him to take a nap before he went home because he looked exhausted. My, uh, Tony, if you ever seen these priests, you know how meticulous they are about their appearance. Right. Leaving this house in the morning, they looked like they were coming out of battle, which of course they were. But he related <coughs> to me that day, coming home, how when he woke up this morning, that his pillow was soaked with blood. Now, the blood that she's speaking of is called an apport through teleportation. This is meant to frighten the priests. It's meant to frighten us so that we would stop our investigation. Mm -hmm. But we understand and know the powers of devils. And fortunately for us, we have some type of protection, which I think comes from when I was a boy yet, the Blessed Mother, uh, Padre Pio, whom we pray to all the time. And without this protection, this angelic protection, we wouldn't be sitting here talking right now. This next slide, Ed, what is this? Uh, this is the convent now, uh, where in Brookfield of St. Joseph's, where the first exorcism was performed, mm -hmm. which was unsuccessful. It was at this time that I left the convent because nothing was happening and went back 
to, to the, the house. Brookfield farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And this is where the rocking chair was going back and forth, and I heard the <coughs> growling sounds and the pounding sounds. Now, Tony, I don't want you to think that that blood on the pillow was the priest, because it was not. That was not his own blood. He was n not bleeding. That was an apport, something that had dematerialized at one point and reappeared at another point. That mm -hmm. was, in this case, really meant to terrify him. One of, the, one of him. the frightening things that occurred to uh, Arnie and Debbie, uh, they would sleep on the floor oh, yes. uh, next to David. If he woke up, then they'd be there to control him. And uh, what they seen and <clears throat> described was a, a bone-like hand that came up through the floor, green, mm -hmm. and an arm. Now, again, these types of things are meant to frighten. Because they when do. a person becomes frightened, <clears throat> they will throw off psychic energy into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. which a negative force will use as a fuel to manifest itself more. Okay, now where exactly did the exorcism take place? Oh, there's a slide right here. Is that's, that the church? That's, yes, it is, Tony. That's the church. <clears throat> and the doorway that you're off to the right. Mm -hmm. the, the basement. See, it, they now have a new, very beautiful church. Now, the church in That's the church in Brookfield. That was the first church. There's another one there now. There's another beautiful okay. church, and it was down in that basement, which was adjacent to the school. Mm -hmm. Now, Tony, after the exorcism had been performed there, they knew they couldn't do it anymore. There was so much noise and so much violence during that exorcism that it was even heard in the elementary Catholic school. Well, the doors in back of the church would open and close. The pews were actually moving, which are bolted down. Hymn books that were in the uh, seats next to us flew off the seats. Mm -hmm. The boy broke away and from two of us and attacked the priest. And attacked the priest. So. Now, what is this I, next slide? I wanted of to show this. Oh, this is Debbie. Debbie and I. Yes, it's and Debbie. we're at the shrine in uh, Brookfield, right there. Mm -hmm. That's okay. David's sister. Right. We would but go I there. I brought a lot. model with me of a dinosaur here. You did. And this model dinosaur had just been completed by David, the young boy who was possessed. And if we could close in on that, as he finished with this. Suddenly, it started to walk on its own, of its own volition toward the family. Mm -hmm. That plastic and dinosaur it, started plastic to walk. Dinosaur, yeah, and and it, a deep, gruff voice mm -hmm. came out of it and said, Beware, you're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And you know, one time we were at the church there. We were showing a group of people where the exorcism took place, and a man was taking recordings. And on his recording, he got the same deep, gruff voice which said, Why are you here? Yeah, oh, he, he was, we were explaining, we were talking to a group, Tony, and this man was recording what we were saying about the Brookfield case when, when okay, that so had occurred. Okay, so this case... Uh, now, that animated, Tony. That walked. Actually walked. It actually that walked. walked. It, it doesn't. The, the thing isn't movable like that. You know, that. I, I seem to remember you speaking of a similar incident in the Amityville case. Is that true? Or am that I thinking was a, of the, the lion, the ceramic lion. Yes, the ceramic lion. Now, why lion would that happen? Is that just to scare everybody? Why would... Why it's would... to frighten people. It's to frighten them, as I said earlier, because as you become frightened, you throw off this psychic energy. Devils, demons, evil spirits can use this as a fuel to manifest more phenomena. Mm -hmm. They and need some kind of energy, and that's the energy. And you mm -hmm. know, David, the voices that he would hear when he was under possession, Tony, they would tell him things. For instance, they told him that Arnie Johnson was going to fall out of a tree. And Arnie did fall, but thank God, you know, he wasn't badly hurt. And, and the beast, as they called him, also told the boy that at the end of the trial, mm -hmm. the last day, the lights would dim down in the courtroom. And they did. And they, they did, did dim. So what was the outcome of that trial? Well, the outcome was that uh, Arnie couldn't, we couldn't use the defense of the devil made him do it, so they, I think it was manslaughter. Yes, because and, uh, he served very Arnie little got, time. Arnie uh, got four years, but I think he only did uh, two years of that. And you couldn't keep a young man like this in prison for something he didn't do. No, and his behavior was excellent. But Tony, he was, uh, he, him and Debbie were married in prison. Oh, they were. They, were, they have they, a business together. They today, live in Milford today. They're, they have they're two, happy. They have two sons. They're, they're normal. Sons. Everything's normal. Oh, now. yes. Very normal. Oh, now, very how about normal. David? Is David doing okay? David, David, David works with his dad. Very normal. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's a fine. Young man today, I guess, uh, soon to be married or whatever he's going to be doing. Yeah. 
If we could digress for just a minute. Now, I know when we first started talking about the case. Yes. I meant to ask, but I forgot. What is the reason that David oh, yes. was possessed in the first place? The reason David became possessed was because his mother and sister, unfortunately, were fooling around with witchcraft. They met a group of people mm -hmm. in upstate New York while they were uh, snowmobiling. And these people, from what we understand, were into satanic activities. Had them go back to their house that night. And uh, for some reason, they turned on the mother. And uh, when Debbie and Arnie at home were looking for a rent, the first time that the beast made itself known was in this small house in Brookfield, mm -hmm. where David said that something pushed him onto the bed, and he could see an old man. And the description was a very, hor very horrifying description. Well, mm -hmm. he, he said that this is how he explained it. He explained that this man was standing there. He told about the plaid shirt the guy was wearing, told everything about the guy. But that night, what he could see in that house appeared in the Brookfield home, their own home. Only now, this little 11-year-old kid, this is how he put it, he was there again in my bedroom, but now he looked all burnt and he had feet like a deer. Oops. Oh boy, that's an amazing case. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's interested in knowing a little bit more about the case, this is the book that was written back in 1980 by Gerald Brittle and Ed Lorraine Warren, The Devil in Connecticut. Um, I read the book, it's a fascinating book. For anyone who wants to get the book, it's kind of difficult to get, but if you do find it, you won't be disappointed. And as an added treat, I know Ed and Lorraine would be more than willing to autograph the book for you. And Lorraine, Ed, how can they, again, contact you if they have any problems or questions or letters mm -hmm. they'd like to write? Well, Tony, we do get, we, do re we are receiving a lot of letters from people who are, are writing in about problems. What's the address? Post office box, well, send it to the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren, post office box 41, Monroe, Connecticut, 06468. Now, if they have questions, Tony, or if they have problems, just have them write and we'll be I, glad I'd like to, to add to that. We've had good. two letters last week of people who have hauntings right in this area. Mm -hmm. We've been to their homes and we were able to help them. Very good. Another fascinating case. Mm -hmm. I thank you both. Thank you. So, for Ed Warren, Lorraine Warren, I'm Tony Spera. Until next time, good night.